Ahmed Arbery was a 25-year-old black American Muslim man who was brutally gunned down by three white men as he was out jogging in Glynn County, Georgia, USA. Now we've all heard about this story and how long it took to prosecute the murderers and they are now serving life sentences. But if you look at the autopsy and the cold facts as we will here today, there are still some significant unanswered questions. For example, how did Ahmed actually die? The report says shotgun wounds. This is not a physiological process leading to death. Is it true Ahmed fought back after receiving gunshots? And why did the white police officer who arrived on scene whilst Ahmed was still alive and breathing just watch him bleed out and die? Three white people went to prison for the murder of an innocent black man, but should there have been a fourth? Hi, welcome back to the channel. My name is Dr. Aziz. I'm a physician based in the UK, working in both emergency and family medicine with also a background in psychology from Cambridge. In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at the tragic murder and autopsy report of Ahmed Arbery. Some I don't believe anyone else has done so a special thanks to the brilliant guys at autopsyfiles.org for providing the full report. Just to give viewers fair warning there will be distressing photographs and video clips so viewer discretion is certainly arrived. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael along with William Roddy Bryan chased Ahmed Arbery for several minutes whilst he was out running before they caught up with him and shot him dead in cold blood all the while filming the incident. Although no arrests were made for several months once the video was released and after much controversy the three men were eventually sent to prison for life. Anyway, there is plenty of analysis of the trial and circumstances of Ahmed's death, but the focus of this video is on Ahmed's autopsy report carried out by Dr. Edward Donahue, who also spoke out of the trial giving medical evidence and also the rationale behind Ahmed not receiving any medical treatment on scene. So if we look at the autopsy report here, the body is received clothed in a camouflage bandana, a tan bandana, white t-shirt and so forth. All clothing is bloodstained. We have here a picture showing during his trial of Ahmed's bloody t-shirt and you can see one one of the large bullet holes here. Ahmed was actually shot at three times. The first shot tore the ulnar artery in Ahmed's right wrist, a major blood vessel, hit his chest, breaking several ribs and caused internal bleeding. The second shot missed and the third shot point blank punctured a major artery and vein in Ahmed's axilla, aka armpit, fracturing bones in the shoulder and arm and causing massive bleeding. So there are many minor abrasions noted but we see the major and fatal injuries here in the autopsy report where it says evidence of injuries. So number one here, it says on the lower chest in the midline there is a gaping shotgun wound measuring 1.9 by 1.5 inches. It also mentions a residual blood in the right chest cavity measuring 50 cc. I'll come back to this point later on because this is a key physiological process which I believe actually caused the death but was not actually specifically mentioned in this report. Coming on to number two, it says here on the left upper chest and left axilla there is a gaping shotgun wound of entrance 2.3 by 1.5 inches. So this is a bigger entrance wound certainly and this was most likely what killed Ahmed although any of the shots could have done. If we go down a little bit further it says numerous injured nerves and blood vessels are visible in the left axilla you have breakage of the left humerus basically the big bone in your upper arm and the left scapula the shoulder blade it mentions here buckshot pellets are cut, recovered from the wound if we go down a little further it says on the left upper back there are seven shotgun exit defects so this particular gunshot caused significant damage no doubt causing significant internal bleeding and out through the back now on to number three which actually refers to the first shot that was fired it says here that there is a deep gaping shotgun graze wound 2.5 by 2.5 inches. Now going back to the incident after this first shot Ahmed actually fought back and Dr. Donahue the medical examiner was asked about this in the trial. He explained that it would have been a fight or flight reaction that raised Arbery's heart rate and blood pressure while sending adrenaline coursing through his body. I would agree with this. It does take time to bleed out and the initial shot was on the arm before deflecting onto his chest. Any such incident would trigger our sympathetic system, our body's involuntary response to stress situations the blood pressure and pulse goes up the pupils dilate we react instinctively and this is what poor Ahmed tried to do the subsequent shots rendered him incapacitated and onto the floor where he was still alive but rapidly losing blood and dying and if we come down to the bottom of autopsy report it says cause of death multiple shotgun wounds and homicide hmm yes technically true but how does a person actually die what is death in fact there are two types of death that is recognized in the medical field and they often go hand in hand especially in scenarios such as this one is cardiac death death. Traditionally, when a person no longer had a pulse, they were considered dead. Of course, with modern medical interventions such as CPR and life support machines, we are beyond that and more commonly use brain death. In a scenario such as this, essentially what we have is hypovolemia, loss of volume or blood loss, one of eight reversible causes of cardiac arrest, which would lead to lack of blood circulation and organ death, including the brain. So that's basically how one dies in this kind of scenario and how Ahmed died, albeit while still alive and at the feet of a police officer. Because 
Because at this point, a white police officer, Ricky Minshew, who was nearby and had received reports of a suspicious black male, arrived on scene. He actually saw the perpetrators on site after they had shot Ahmed, and you can see some of the footage here. Officer Minshew did call for medical and police backup, obviously, but he did not administer first aid. Ahmed was still breathing and bleeding out at this point, but Minshew kept his distance. Why did he do this, and were his reasons justifiable? He cited two broad reasons for not giving first aid. The first one was regarding the safety and integrity of the scene and the second one was medical. Regarding the safety issue, the shooters were still on scene and he didn't know exactly what was going on. He said, being that I was the only officer on scene without having any other police units to watch my back, there was no way I could have switched my attention to anything medical and still be able to watch my surroundings and watch after my own safety. And he is right. Whether you're a police officer, a doctor, a firefighter, we have what is called the DRABC approach to giving medical aid to someone. This is a universally accepted protocol worldwide. D stands for danger. You need to make sure before anything else that the area is clear of danger for yourself and others before you can even check the patient. Now, I don't care if you're an armed police officer in American streets. When you're on your own and there's clearly been a shooting with the agitated perpetrators still on scene, you're perfectly entitled to worry about your own safety first. It is discretionary or subjective, however, whether someone feels safe or not. Maybe another officer would have gone straight to the aid of Ahmed. I don't know. When a second officer arrived on scene, they did attempt first aid, alas to little avail. Time is crucial, however, when it comes to serious injuries such as this. And this brings me on to my second point. Officer Ricky Minshew then gave his medical rationale for not giving first aid. And I disagree profoundly with him on this on multiple fronts. I believe both he and the local authorities failed significantly here. And this has gone under the radar. Now it is mentioned here that Officer Minshew told prosecutors he did not have the adequate training to render first aid and lacked proper equipment. Now this is really odd for two major reasons. Firstly, you'd think in America, where every day more than 300 people are shot, of which over 100 per day are killed, that all police officers would have first aid training. In fact, I would like to think all police officers around the world would be trained in first aid. Now, I've done a bit of digging and looked more specifically at Georgia Police Academy training requirements, and it goes without saying that emergency medical training is a mandatory requirement. So how this excuse was allowed to fly in a court of law, I'm not sure. Now, even if you're rusty on your first aid, or even if someone doesn't know first aid and they call 911 or 9 or they radio through, they are given basic instructions as to what to do. Check if they're breathing, check if there is a pulse, put pressure on the wound, start pressing on the chest. So this excuse of not being adequately trained is ridiculous. And also you don't need special equipment for bleeding wounds. Putting pressure on them with anything, a jacket, a sweater to try and stop the bleeding is better than nothing and certainly better than just standing there and letting the person bleed out. And this is exactly what the second officer attending did. He put pressure on the wounds, albeit clearly too late. So this was a major error, both by the officer and his backup team who apparently did not advise on basic first aid steps of assessing the patient. Now things get even more bizarre from Officer Minchu. For someone who claims he does not even have basic first aid knowledge or skills, he then goes on to give his expert medical opinion about why Ahmed Arbery was beyond help and why not giving first aid was justified medically. Officer Minchu, when asked about Arbery's condition, he said he was face down and looked unresponsive to his surroundings. He appeared deceased and noted that the amount of blood underneath him was exceeding the perimeter of his body. He said he then heard a type of laboured breathing he recognised as death rattle and said he had encountered similar situations in the past where people did not survive much longer. And when asked if he performed CPR, he said no. Wrong, wrong and wrong. There are some major red flags here. When you assess a sick or injured person as basic first aid, you do not decide, even as an experienced doctor, let alone someone who claims not to even know first aid, that someone is beyond help and is going to die regardless. If a patient goes into cardiac arrest in the hospital, for example, we are legally obliged to give CPR unless someone someone can demonstrate that the patient has a do not resuscitate form or until a senior medic decides efforts to resuscitate have been futile until now and calls it. But if we don't initiate CPR, certainly as doctors, we stand to lose our jobs just for that one incident of inaction. You don't just look at a person and think, hmm, lots of blood, dodgy breathing, let's call it, shall we? Being face down doesn't mean a person can't be saved. The amount of blood at the scene, and certainly the amount in this case, is also not an indicator to decide not to attempt first aid. Labored breathing, or death rattle as Officer Minshew called it, is also not a reason to not even bother with first aid or CPR. Labored breathing can be from any number of reasons. In this case, he's been shot in the chest, he's bleeding out, there's lack of oxygen exchange in lungs, and he probably has one or several pneumothoraces. Of course he's going to have labored breathing. And I've seen and carried out successful resuscitation attempts on many patients with labored breathing, death rattle or whatever you want to call it. Point is, you don't have to have detailed medical knowledge. You just need to know what to check for. Airway, breathing, circulation, the basic ABCs, and then to commence CPR. You check 
check if the person is responsive. If not, you call for help. You check for a pulse. If there is none, you commend CPR. If the breathing is agonal, the technical term for labored breathing, again, you commend CPR. Part of CPR is also to stop any obvious bleeding. This officer did not carry out any basic first aid checks, nor did he commend CPR. He claimed he was not trained in first aid, which is very worrying in itself. And then he tries to justify absolutely erroneously and bizarrely why, in his medical opinion, Ahmed Aubrey was allowed to just bleed out in front of him and die. This is truly astonishing. Now, as far as I'm aware, Officer Minshew didn't really get into any trouble, and I believe there are three main reasons for this, two of which I actually agree with. Number one, as mentioned, he did not feel he was safe, and I completely understand and agree with that. Some people have commented that as a white officer turning up to reports of a black man causing a disturbance and finding white men having shot him dead and then just watching him die, this could be construed as some kind of prejudice. I don't know. If he says he felt unsafe whilst on his own at the scene of an immediate shooting with perpetrators still pacing the scene, then we should give him the benefit of the doubt. Number two, the medical examiner, Dr. Donahue, was asked, is there anything law enforcement or EMS could have done to save his life at the scene? To which Dr. Donahue replied, I don't think so, no. Which I agree with. A shotgun injury, let alone two, a person is unlikely to survive from it. But there is also a difference between could and should first aid have been initiated. If the scene was safe, then it should have. And we'll never really know because no one tried. Think back to 1997 and Princess Diana. Remember the state she was found in? Remember the efforts they went to to try and save the people's princess? A point to certainly ponder on. Number three, there is something apparently in the legal field known as the Bruton error, where to the best of my understanding, you don't want to implicate other people and deflect away from the main perpetrators. And perhaps rightly so, where I think they want to the focus to remain on the three killers. My background is in medicine psychology, so I could be wrong here. Anyway, in summary, Ahmad Arbery, a young black Muslim man, was tragically and inexplicably hunted down by three white men and shot to die in what can only be described as a modern day lynching. They have rightly been incarcerated. I mean, whatever happened to the death penalty in America? Hmm? But I still think there are several unanswered questions and red flags that as a minimum should be investigated and lessons learned from, particularly as we have had a young man both breathing and bleeding out at the feet of a police officer and with several gravely erroneous medical statements and incompetence demonstrated by the police. Anyway, I hope we can learn from this and less innocent people are killed and more are saved. There are more autopsy and investigation reports coming out on this channel. Thanks again to autopsyfiles.org. If you're finding any of the content here interesting or useful, please hit the subscribe, like and notifications button. Until next time, stay safe.